My name is Steve Marks, and I love files. I feel like I'm among friends here, and I can tell you that uh, I've been using files for a lot of years. I use files pretty much every day. Um, I keep all of my photos and my videos in files. I even sometimes share files with my friends. When I go to work, I use files even more. I use them for spreadsheets, for documents, for collaborating on presentations with my coworkers. And as a developer, I love files because as powerful and ubiquitous as they are, they're still incredibly simple. So what are files, you might be asking if you've never used a computer before. People just come to Fort Mason for tourism reasons, and they might have just wandered in, just setting, you know, setting it up. Um, we all know files in the way that we use them, but let me reintroduce them in sort of a nuts and bolts, kind of ground up developer way. To me, a file is a named sequence of bytes. And that's really all it is. The name is sort of a path. In our file system, we kind of, we treat this as a hierarchy. And then they're just contents of that file, and those are just bytes. What makes files so useful for us is that there are file formats. So the fact that there are JPEGs, and there are movies, and there are Word documents, and there are PDFs, and the fact that all of our apps understand these different file formats in the same way, that's what makes files so powerful for us. Files get even better when you put them in Dropbox. Most of us know this. We've used Dropbox. We've seen what happens. Um, but I have the benefit of working at Dropbox, and I can tell you a little bit about how that works, what happens to a file when you put it in Dropbox. This gets a little bit technical, but bear with me. Um, when you put a file in Dropbox, it is bitten by a radioactive spider, and this, uh, this turns it into something we call a super file. That's the technical term. And super files gain all these superpowers. Super files that are in Dropbox are suddenly available on all of your devices. They're available in all of your apps. They're even available online. They're everywhere at once. Super files, when deleted, can be brought back to life. If you have a file in Dropbox and accidentally delete it, you can go onto the website and just restore it. Uh, super files can also travel through time. So if you, every time you save a file in Dropbox, a revision is created, and you can roll back to those previous revisions by restoring them, just the same way that you can, you can undelete a file. So super files, the ones that live in Dropbox, have all these powers, and we as developers get access to all those super powers by building on top of the Dropbox platform. So what we're gonna talk about today is the APIs that are available to you to work with files and gain those superpowers. We have two different APIs that we're gonna talk about in this session. I'm gonna dive into the core API first, and then I'm gonna bring my friend Sean on stage, and he's gonna talk about the sync API. The core API is really simple. It's a web API. It's based on HTTP. I'm scared to say REST, so I say REST-ish. Um, it has pretty friendly paths, and it uses HTTP verbs, but it's REST-ish, all right. As long as we're all in agreement there. Um, JSON is the file format, uh, or sort of the wire format that we use for pretty much everything uh, except the raw file contents. So if you do something like ask about the metadata of a file, you'll get back JSON. So it's very easy to read, very easy to understand, very easy to program with in any language. We use OAuth for authentication, and I'm pleased to announce that as of today, OAuth 2.0 is officially released on the Dropbox platform. Yay, OAuth 2.0. Um, I hope you guys are excited about OAuth 2. It's actually, if you haven't looked at it yet, uh, I recommend a website called OAuthBible.com. It's from the folks at Meshape, and it does a really good job of just walking through kind of how it works, just kind of step by step. OAuth 2 is really simple. We'll see an example uh, soon to show you just how easy it is. You probably won't have to do any of the OAuth stuff yourself because you'll probably be using one of the libraries we have. We have libraries in a bunch of popular languages, and the ones where we don't, because it's just HTTP and JSON and OAuth, uh, a lot of you in this room probably have written libraries in other languages, so if you don't see one in your favorite language, ask around. There might be one in this room, or it's really easy to build one. So this is what it looks like when you make a call to the core API. So as promised, it's just HTTP. That first line is showing you it's a GET request. In this case, I'm getting the metadata for a file called hello.txt, so that's why you see slash metadata in the URL. Um, it's just a GET request, it's just HTTP. The next line shows you everything you need to do to authenticate a call using OAuth 2. 
So this doesn't show you the part where you sort of log in the user and get permission. Um, I'll show you a little bit of code later for how that works. But once you're logged in, you just need to attach this token to every call. So it's the authorization header. You put bearer and then the bearer token, hence the name bearer. That's the ZWP2FW thing you see up there. That's what they look like, a bunch of gibberish. Um, you just attach that and that's all that it takes to authenticate. It's much simpler than the signing that you see in OAuth 1. By the way, if you're using OAuth 1, we're gonna continue supporting that. I made this big like we're doing OAuth 2, but OAuth 1 is gonna keep working. Um, so there's no need to like run around and update your code now. Um, and as I promised, the response is typically JSON. So this is what it looks like if you fetch the metadata. There are some other fields there that I've left out, but you get things like the size of the file. Um, you get whether there's a thumbnail. You get like what icon to use. So sort of some extra stuff about it. And that rev field is all about those revisions where you can roll back um, undelete things and things like that. So that was the metadata operation. We have a lot of the operations you would expect when you're working with files, like read, write, delete, copy, move. These are kind of just sort of the basics of what you'd want. And there's actually a lot more. If you go to uh, dropbox.com slash developers and click on the core API, you can see the full scroll to your heart's content as you read through sort of all the different functions that are available there. So this is, that's the basics of how you make these calls. I've sort of started in the middle where you have this bearer token already, where you've done OAuth. Let's talk a little bit about the permissions that your app can have and how those work. So I've ordered these uh, from sort of least permissions to most permissions, and I would, I would encourage all of you and implore that you stay sort of towards the top of this list. Um, so we have found, we actually have data and so we're able to look at this. We have found that uh, users are much more likely to authorize your app on the Dropbox platform if you ask for less permissions. This kind of makes sense. Um, there are a bunch of users who don't pay attention, but it turns out there are a lot more than you might think who really do read about like what permissions you're getting and are savvy about only accepting the permissions they want to give. So I would start at app folder at the top here. App folder means that your app gets its own folder inside Dropbox. So it'll live at Dropbox slash apps slash my to-do list about cats, whatever the name of your app happens to be. And you have full access within that folder. So you have read, write, you can create files, uh, create folders, move things around, et cetera. But you don't see anything outside of that. So you basically have this view of just sort of a single folder and all of its subfolders inside Dropbox. Um, there are times when that doesn't work. So if you're trying to build, for example, a text editor, and you wanna be able to edit files in someone's Dropbox no matter where they are, living just inside this app folder is a little bit restrictive. And so there we have a new permission type. It's been in beta for the past couple weeks, but today we are launching the file typed permission. File types permission lets you ask for a class of files. So it's sort of at the level of, you might ask for images or documents or text files. We have documentation that shows you all of the file extensions that means, but that's how that works. It's basically a list of file extensions. And you get access to those wherever they are inside Dropbox. So to your app, if you've used the API before, to your app, this kind of looks like a Dropbox where there's nothing but text files. So you'll see some other folders and you'll look around and you won't find anything else in them. So your app gets this filtered view. So not only does it mean you can ask for fewer permissions, which as I said is a good way to get people to actually use your app, um, but you don't have to deal with filtering things out. You get this view that is really just the files that you care about. So this is a really good option uh, if you need to work with existing files wherever they live. And finally, we have full Dropbox permissions. So if you want, you can ask and a user can authorize your app to have full read, write, create file, delete file, get thumbnail, whatever. If operation, every operation that we have, you can get on every file inside Dropbox, wherever it is. Earlier today, we mentioned this uh, new thing called drop-ins, the chooser and the saver. I'm gonna put these on this slide, even though they're not quite a permissions model, they're actually the opposite. With drop-ins, the user is in charge of picking a file and bringing it into your app, or choosing where to save a file back into Dropbox. So you don't get any long-lasting permissions to someone's Dropbox at all. You get just sort of the files that they choose to bring in and show to your app. Um, this is a really appealing option. So users here don't have to grant your, your app any particular access. It's basically just like opening a file for them. So if you do just need to do these kind of basic operations, um, consider drop-ins. All right, I've talked a big game here. I've said it's really easy. I've said that uh, you guys will be able to figure it out. Let me prove it to you. I'm gonna do a little demo. 
built this app that, uh, it's basically an approval flow for Instagram pictures. So we wanted to pull pictures from Instagram. Uh, I think uh, Dan alluded to this before. If you're using the hashtag DBX2013, that's what we're using for the conference. We're gonna pull photos from Instagram and kind of put them up on a web page. Knowing this audience as I do, we're gonna have an approval process first. So the photos are gonna go into a folder in Dropbox called unapproved, and then I'm gonna move them to approved and only the approved ones show up. So that's the basic premise of the app. Um, let's switch over to the demo laptop and I will show you how it works. <laughs> the, uh, the gulls approve. Um, so this is the start of the flow in my app. So I've, I've gone to the app, I'm not logged in yet, and so uh, the app redirected me to log in with Dropbox with OAuth. And so this is the kind of page that you'll get. Um, it says the name of the app, DBX Demo, uh, it gives my stupendous icon here um, so that the, the user knows what, uh, what app they're authorizing. And you probably can't read this because it's a little small, but this line here says, this app will be able to read and modify only your images. So this is that file types permission. I've said, as an app developer, I want access to images. As a user, I see that that's all that this app is gonna have access to. Now, I've heard some amazing things about this DBX demo app, and so I'm gonna go ahead and allow it to access my files. And here we have a very impressive UI that I built from scratch. Thank you. Um, it says hello. It says, yeah, that was, I shouldn't have begged for that. Um, it says hello, it says that I haven't approved any images yet, which I haven't, and it has this big fetch from Instagram button which is actually gonna do the import. None of this stuff is gonna work yet because I haven't actually written the code. It's all empty. We're gonna write that code now. Um, this is a Python app, it's written in Flask for people who are just kinda trying to follow along. Um, we've done this bit already, which is the OAuth flow. When I first came to the app, I got redirected, thanks to this line, and when I came back as an authorized user, the, real, the important part of this code is the access token. So we got back from the user an OAuth token that we can use to authenticate all our calls to the core API. I'm saving that off in like some, some custom database -y stuff that I did here. Um, but the important point is now, from now on, we have the logged in user and we know an access token for them. So the first thing we're gonna do is, look at this, it just says hello, how unpersonalized. Let's have it say hello and then my name. So it's gonna say hello info.displayName. Where did info come from, you ask? Well, down here we're passing in an info parameter and it's the result of calling get account info. So that's one of the operations on the core API. You can get account info like the user ID, the name, and the email address of the logged in user, among other things. Let's implement that. So first I'm gonna fetch from the database the access token that I stored earlier, and then I'm going to create a Dropbox client object that uses that token, and finally I'm gonna call account info and return that. If I did that right, when we refresh the page, we should see hello, DBX2013, which is the name of my demo Dropbox user. That's actually it. You now know the basics of, there are a bunch of other APIs, we're about to play with some of them, but all of the calls are like that. You use that token, you make a simple call, uh, JSON comes back, and if you're using one of our libraries, it gets kind of nicely parsed for you. All right, so the next thing we wanna do is we wanna fetch some, some images from Instagram. This is also not gonna work because I haven't written that code. Let's go take a look at what happens when we click that. Um, here's the fetch operation. We're getting some stuff from Instagram. We're getting the five most recent things tagged with DBX 2013. I'm already dreading what those are gonna be. Um, and down here in a loop, we call something called save to Dropbox, which takes a path and, uh, and a URL. So let's implement that method and actually save things to Dropbox. So we're gonna start out the same way. We're gonna get the token for the user. We're going to make a client that uses that token. And we're gonna call a method called put file. We're gonna tell where we wanna put the file and then we need the contents of the file. So I'm gonna fetch those using the requests library um, and save that file. All right, I'm double checking now because if this doesn't work, you're all gonna be disappointed. Uh, that looks right, no one yelled anything. Let's click fetch from Instagram and let's hop over and look in the unapproved folder they should be rolling in. So this is actually saving right now from Instagram photos into unapproved. Cool, so the next thing we wanna do is approve them. 
let's see, uh, I approve of this one. That looks approve worthy. Um, let me move that file to approved. And uh, now I want to display it. So what should show up here, see how it says you haven't approved any images? It should show any images that I've already approved. So anything that's in that approved folder should go there. It doesn't yet, because yet again, we're just returning an, an empty list here. We haven't implemented that. So let's take a look at where that comes from. So that list of images comes from here. We call list files on the approved path. That gives us a bunch of uh, files in Dropbox. And then we use something called get media, um, or the get media URL, which is gonna take one of those paths and bring back a link that can, we can embed directly into the page. So it's gonna bring back uh, a URL that goes straight to the image contents. So let's implement those two methods. List files first. We're going to type this again. Somebody told me that it's really bad to copy paste code around, so I just type it every time. <laughs> um, it's gotta be better, right? Okay, so we're gonna do uh, metadata. So I actually already showed, remember on the slide we did a metadata call? When you do that on a folder, one of the things that comes back is the contents of that folder. So this is gonna give us all of the files in there. And then for each file in there, we're going to get the file path, and we're gonna return that whole thing. Um, if it were up to me, every program would be written on just one line, <laughs> so, as you can maybe see here. So uh, if this is hard to read, if you don't do Python a lot, this is just looping over all these things and getting the path from each one. So there's a bunch of other stuff about each of the files. We really just care about the path. Okay, once we have those, we're gonna see a call to get media URL on each one. So let's implement that. Uh, still not copy pasting, I refuse. And here we're going to call media on the path and get back a URL. Okay, that was lots of typing. So this is the point where everyone just collectively hold your breath and cross your fingers because this is a good time when I refresh for it to just fail utterly. Let's refresh. And there's the file that we approved. Hurrah. All right, let's, let's switch back to the slides and kind of review for a minute. So um, this is hopefully exactly the code that I typed. <laughs> if not, I did something wrong, but it worked anyway. Uh, I've bolded the functions that we called. So we called account info, we called put file, we called metadata, and we called media. As I mentioned, there are a lot of other operations in the core API. This is an abridged list. If you go to dropbox.com slash developers and go to the core API documentation there, you can see the full list. I want to particularly point out to you the last item on this list, the Delta API. The Delta API is a way for you to ask Dropbox what has changed since the last time I asked. So it's a cursor-based kind of like you're paging through changes over time. And if you're using the Delta API, it probably means you're building something like Sync. You're probably asking Dropbox for changes so you can update the state of your app uh, and keep, keep in sync with what's happening in Dropbox. We have an API called the Sync API that's specifically for this purpose. So if you see yourself doing the Delta API, uh, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at the Sync API. And to talk about the Sync API, I'm gonna bring out uh, my friend, Sean Lynch. I noticed something and I just wanna share it with you guys. If you look really closely at Sean Lynch's name, the word Sync <laughs> is in it. Um, coincidence? <laughs> Probably. Uh, so, <laughs> so please welcome to the stage uh, the, the product manager for the platform team, Sean Lynch. Thanks, buddy. Hey, everybody. So I'm gonna take a moment and step away from the code and just talk about sync as a concept. Um, sync is probably maybe the quintessential hard technical problem that regular people, regular users just don't really grasp. So if you ask somebody non-technical, hey, can you explain sync to me, you're probably gonna get some permutation of if I make a change on my computer, it shows up on my phone, hopefully a couple of seconds later. And if anybody has actually tackled sync before, man, I wish it was just that easy. Um, so as Steve mentioned, we do have the Delta uh, call as part of the core API, and it's built, and its express purpose is to build out sync. The, 
the issue is that it sort of has this baked in assumption that you have a great connection to Dropbox. You have a big pipe, lots of bandwidth, really low latency, so that for all of your users that you want to keep in sync, you're constant, you can constantly pull and check, hey, are there any updates? Now, that works great for the type of server application that you saw uh, Steve build up, but if you're in mobile development, you have uh, this problem. You can't rely on the connection on that mobile device. And the users don't care. The user expectations are, regardless of connection, regardless of what uh, conference venue that has bad wireless, um, they expect that it works. Uh, so it means that as a developer, you need to have all of the sort of contingencies and edge cases sorted out. For example, in the case where we have sort of spotty, spotty coverage, you have to have an app that retries, takes advantage of the fact that, hey, you know, the file hasn't downloaded yet, let's give it a couple of tries. If it doesn't work, if the device is completely offline, you have to cache all of those changes, to store them locally, the device actually loses power, they need to be there so that when you come back online, it handles that transition gracefully. And you have to handle that transition gracefully. So upload your changes, download any new changes, deal with conflicts as the case may be. That's all up to you. Now, we have some really, really talented developers on the Dropbox platform that have built Sync using Delta on mobile devices. Some of them are here today, and thank you guys for that. Uh, but for mere mortal developers like myself, uh, that would be a full-time job. It would be actually taking the time to implement that in a way that just works, that you don't have edge cases, you're not corrupting anybody's data, means that I'm not actually working on my application logic. Now, the platform team, we saw this, and not surprisingly, Dropbox has been thinking about Sync for a little while now. Uh, it's basically what we get up and do every day. Um, and we've built up a lot of sort of best practices, knowledge, and know-how around how to implement Sync, particularly on devices with kind of crappy connections. And as we were seeing all these developers integrate, try to integrate uh, the core API on their mobile apps, we're trying to figure out, hey, can we help them? Can we provide some additional uh, functionality to get them going? And so that was why we created the Sync API. Sync API is really easy to explain. Uh, first, it's available for iOS and Android developers. And it's built on the core API. It's built on the API that Steve was up here talking about just a couple of seconds ago. Um, and on top of the core API, we take a lot of that logic, a lot of that caching, that know-how that Dropbox has built into its own clients and layer it on top of the core API in a way that you can just bundle into your application. Another way to think about this is it's almost like going to dropbox.com, downloading the Dropbox app, and just cramming it into your application so that it takes care of all the syncing for you. In fact, when we jump into the code here, what you're gonna see is the API is just a file system. It's just the file system that you'd pull out of any programming 101 textbook. It's really gonna be read files, write files, list files, and the Sync API and that logic is gonna take care of all the communication back and forth to Dropbox. It's gonna pull in any files, uh, if you write, it's gonna push those changes after you're done, after your application continues on its way. And if you're offline, Sync API takes care of that. It'll ship it when the connection comes back. Now, we add a couple of things to that file system to sort of give it some of that Dropbox power. And I'm really excited. The version of the Sync API that we shipped just this morning now supports um, share links and thumbnails, which are two really great features from the core APIs. So now you don't have to decide on what, whether you wanna use one or the other. Um, but one of the features that we've had since the beginning that I wanna point out is change listeners. And the reason that change listeners are interesting, they sort of speak to how we think users now expect mobile apps to work. The reality is that if you're building an app on Dropbox, that data is going to change. It's gonna be either your app sitting on another device, other applications using the file types um, permission that Steve was talking about, or just the user syncing new data. And the expectation is that your app is responsive, that it feels alive when that data changes. So change listeners make it really easy to just build that into your application, get a call back when something has changed, whether it's a specific file or a path, um, and have your application have that ability to sort of just respond to changes underneath. Um, so I'm gonna show you what that looks like in a, a demo. Um, I'm gonna skip myself the public embarrassment of any typos, but I'm gonna use Steve's, um, Steve's demo application and sort of extend on that uh, by building myself a Sync API app that I can use to approve and reject photos on the go. So let's switch back to the computer here. 
and we'll pull up Eclipse. And I'm just gonna walk through it and I'll show you where things are similar and then when they start to diverge for the Sync API. So the first thing that I'm going to do is start link. And that's exactly what you saw in Steve's demo. It's gonna link to the same Dropbox account um, and there's a little bit of additional code around this, but basically what that's doing is deferring to the Dropbox app if it's installed to take care of the authentication flow, Other, otherwise it falls back to a web browser. And the end result is that I get an account back. So that's my get linked account here. And now this is where things start to fork a little bit. What I'm gonna do with that account is actually create a file system. So that's what my DBX file system here. Uh, if you're wondering where the DBX name comes from originally, that's, that's, that was where it's from. Um, so we create our file system, and now we can actually go in and pull things out. So our application is going to show an image on screen, so I can approve or reject it. Um, and that's gonna be this refresh image call here. But before I do, I'm gonna use that path listener that I was just talking about to watch the unapproved folder and check if there's any new photos, any additions that you know, my app should be aware of. So let's take a look at refresh image. Now, if I was coding this app to just work against the local file system on the device, the code would look basically exactly what you'd think. Um, I'm using the DBX file system to call list folder on the unapproved folder. I'm uh, looping over it and I'm just grabbing the most recent one out. And then these are actually the four lines that you saw in Drew's slides earlier. I'm opening a file, I'm actually putting it into sort of the native representation of a bitmap, putting it on the screen and then closing the file. And that's it, that's, now we have a functioning application. I'll switch to it in a second. The thing that I wanna point out here is there's no networking code. I've written nothing to coordinate with Dropbox. I'm not managing connection state at all. I'm just focusing on the actual data in the file system. So if we switch to our Android application here and we'll see how the demo gods are, are feeling for me. Um, we have a couple of photos that Steve thankfully left for me to approve. I'm gonna switch back to his application and just see if there's anything new. So we'll fetch from Instagram and we'll see if we can get some of those come back to our application. So this app's going out and oh, thanks. Thanks for that one, Steve. Um, <laughs> really appreciate the votes of confidence, guys. That's great. Um, cool, all right, so we have an application that's just responding to the data underneath uh, every time that that new file gets added, the application updates its state, and it's actually downloading the file from Dropbox as well. So now I want to approve most of these, it looks like. Um, so let's switch back to Eclipse for a second, and we'll take a look at the logic to do that. Now, if you remember, the action of approving something was just moving from the unapproved folder to the approved folder. And for delete, we're just, or for reject, we're just gonna delete it, we don't need a record. So not surprisingly, the logic to do that is one line or one and a half lines each. We're calling delete on uh, the path or we're calling move and moving it into the approved folder. And that's it, that's kind of unremarkable code. Um, so we went a little bit further and hooked up a gesture detector just so I could be a little theatrical on stage here. Um, and what I'm going to do, <laughs> thanks Steve. Uh, what I'm gonna do is actually, if I swipe to the right, I'm going to approve. And if I swipe to, I don't even wanna reject that. That sounds great. These are all good. Um, okay, we'll, we'll approve a few more here. I'm sorry. And uh, take a look at the application. And we should have all of our approved photos as well. So, <laughs> thanks. To switch back to the slides. Now, uh, Android isn't the only thing that you're gonna be developing on, chances are. Chances are you're gonna be looking at iOS at least. We do have the Sync API available for iOS, and the great thing about it is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can just use the same concepts on both platforms. Um, so here's the code to do the path listeners on iOS. It's a little bit different just because we're sticking with sort of the nomenclature of uh, the iOS platform, but we're watching the unapproved folder, we're calling refresh image when it's done. When we're deleting files, we're looking at the file system and deleting a path, and when we're hitting, uh, when we're downloading files, it's the same four lines. Again, no networking code, we're just going out to the file system, grabbing the file, and showing it on screen. Um, and in fact, that was most of the logic for our application on the iOS side, so we figured out gesture listeners, and if we switch to the computer, I will show you 
got a couple of pictures here, and I can approve, and both applications are going to respond. Um, I like cats, but sorry. Uh, and these all look DBX related, um, and sure enough, all these applications are moving in sync. You can see the Dropbox client working in the background, picking up those changes. Um, and if we refresh Steve's demo, uh, shh, there's a couple of missing there. I might have my left and right switched. Uh, but I've approved a cat. <laughs> DBX material, definitely. Great. Uh, so if we switch back to the slides, that's the end of our SIG API demo. Um, I do want to summarize just a couple of options that you've seen here. Uh, as Steve was up here saying, you have the core API. If you're building on a server, that's definitely the way to go. It's got all the sort of familiar web technologies that you'd expect. It's available in pretty much every language under the, under the sun. Uh, these are the ones that we officially support, but a lot of you in the audience have added every other language we can imagine. Uh, but if you're doing iOS or Android development, you should really be taking a look at the Sync API. It gives you a ton of logic right out of the box so that you don't have to worry about any coordination with Dropbox, just baked in, and you don't write any networking code. Um, and I think that's, oh, one more thing. Um, so next steps for you, if you haven't made a Dropbox app already, you really should do that. To play with all the cool stuff that you're seeing today, you're gonna need one of those. So head to dropbox.com slash developers to set that up. On that page is all of our SDKs, all of our tutorials, um, all of our API docs. Any other day of the year, that'd be the first place you should go. Today, the entire team is here in the building. We're mostly hanging out here at the help desk. If you have questions, if you have problems, come by, let us know what you're working on. We'd love to hear you, um, see what you're working on and uh, help if, if we can. Um, with that, I'm gonna bring Steve up on stage and we'll tackle any questions. We've got a mic stand right here in the middle. Um, so if you have one, come on up. We've also put our, helpfully, we have put our Twitter accounts and our email addresses on here. And so if you have questions after the fact and wanna reach out, please do. I'm gonna particularly plug my email address. <laughs> Um, my role at Dropbox is developer advocate, so it's literally my job to help you. <laughs> so uh, please do email me if you have any, anything that you want to discuss. Do we have any questions now? Please, we love questions. Come could on you, up. Could you come up to the mic if you got a question? Thanks so much, guys, for doing that. Go ahead. Um, so can you use a sync API with shared folders? Yes. Um, up until our beta, you couldn't. So uh, the, one of the limitations of the, the initial release was that it worked with an app folder. Um, as of officially today, we've opened that up to file types permissions that Steve was talking about. So that means that any content that's sitting in shared folders can absolutely be pulled in, and Sync API will, will handle those. In fact, the way I put the rock and the parakeet up there was because I'm sharing that folder with my own account. So I actually just dragged files in on mine. So we actually we did use shared folders. So you just killed that. the illusion that somebody else in the crowd did that for me. It's proof. No, it was, it was me. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any changes to how uh, conflict resolution is done with files? Great question. Um, so on as part of the Sync API, um, we will alert you that there are new files for a version that you have open. So we're giving you an API to handle conflict resolution, but we're not in the same way that the data store is merging automatically, just because we don't know what that data is. So we will alert you, and it makes it easy for your application to do the right thing, but it's, it's not sort of handled automatically. What about Windows or OS X applications? Windows or OS X? We, well, so there are actually two answers to this. There's the core API answer, which is that there are libraries in Python and Ruby and uh, C Sharp, um, since you mentioned Windows, uh, <laughs> and, you know, and a bunch of languages that you use for desktop applications. In the Sync API, today the platforms that are supported are iOS and Android. Um, we'd love to tackle other platforms. We don't have anything to announce in terms of a roadmap for that, but it's really just prioritization for us to figure out which platforms are, are the most important to hit. Um, so we, we lodged, we tally mark for both uh, <laughs> for OS X and for Windows. Um, let us know what, what platforms you're all interested in. Absolutely. Thanks. How are the file types abstraction set up? I mean, you showed images. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you select it at the file extension level? And can you create your own abstractions? You want to cover this? Or, uh, I can do it. So we have, if you go to dropbox.com slash developers and to the right place, I don't know, wherever the permissions sort of section is in the dev guide. I dev think. guide. If you go to the dev guide, we have the list of, but 
today there are basically there are five. There's like images, documents. Why did I start this list without knowing the whole thing? <laughs> Text files, um, videos, and I don't know. Audio. The last one. Audio. Okay. Yeah. All right. It should have been obvious after video. And we have the definition of those. And today the definition of those is literally a list of file extensions. Um, that's it for today. But we'd love to hear if those don't match to the right thing. We're kind of walking this tension line between making it easy for a user to understand what they're giving access to and giving developers just the set that they want. And it's a little bit tough. Those are actually slightly at odds because a user doesn't understand your giant list of extensions. They're never going to read the whole thing. So we try to group them up in a sensible way. But uh, this is the first iteration, and there's no reason we can't change those definitions over time. So please let us know, in particular, if you have some file format that you think really belongs in one of the lists and isn't there. Um, we'd love to get that feedback. This is a question about data types. Um, I noticed that in the earlier demo you did this morning, you were doing um, brush strokes. You know, mm -hmm. you were painting things like that. So I can imagine that in a lot of these applications, you want to store structured data in the type of whatever language they're using, whether it's an array or a key value store or something like that. Can you comment a little bit on the design choice of using a file system and also talk about whether it would be necessary to write serialization for any of these application or language specific primitives into what you've presented here? So let me, the next talk after this one, right? This is yep. the next one, is going to be Brian and uh, Guido, who are going to talk about the, um, the data stores API. It's actually, it's a separate API. It's sort of baked in. You'll find in the sync SDK, you'll find these things together. But there's actually a separate, and there, so in that case, uh, I believe the answer for those strokes is that they're arrays of, uh, of points. And that's how they structure them. They're not being serialized to files. That is actually using the data store API handles natively things like lists um, and other kind of native data types like that. Um, those guys will get into it and ask them again if they haven't answered that question. Here we're working with the API that is just around files. So yeah, thanks. Um, for, well, uh, on the last slide, there was a, the core API had JavaScript as a list uh, as one of the things that it supports, um, and so. Could you talk a little bit about how you can call like the Dropbox from JavaScript without doing any kind of server-side code? Is that a thing? Yeah, you yeah, can. You, you can indeed. And OAuth 2 helps. Yes, actually, that was one of the primary focuses behind tackling OAuth 2 was to enable client-side JavaScript application. Yeah, the way this works in OAuth 2 for the OAuth geeks is there's this implicit flow or the token flow. It goes by different names sometimes, um, where there isn't a secret. The client doesn't have a secret. So unlike OAuth 1, where you have a client secret that you use to sign things, OAuth 2 has this implicit flow where, um, where you basically just get back the bearer token. And then all you need to do is put it in the authorization headers. We support um, cores on all of, our, all of our APIs. So you can call them cross-origin from JavaScript. And, um, and that's about how all it works. I should probably write a blog post about how to do that. That sounds yeah. like a good, good it's, topic to dive it's, into. Uh, currently, um, so the history of the, our JavaScript API was, was actually written by uh, last summer by our intern Victor, mm -hmm. who is somewhere here in the crowd. So he's back Victor. again. Yes. So. Yes. Um, and uh, it's sitting up on the Dropbox GitHub uh, site. It hasn't been brought fully into the fold yet. Um, we have to write sort of like the tutorial and that sort of thing. But it's it's on the way. It just didn't make it in our panic list of all the things we needed to do for this event. Yeah. Um, so you can still just call something like you know Dropbox.put or Dropbox.get. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the same sort of uh, menu of options as the other core API. Yep. Uh, it sounded like when you were um, talking about if you use the sync API from the mobile clients that it's uh, basically calling the Delta API, and if that's true, how often does it do that, and is there an effect on uh, battery? Um, really great question. So it actually uses a mechanism called long polling underneath, or as of the version we released today, uh, it uses a mechanism called long polling underneath. Um, and so that's going to keep a connection open until there are changes. So it's not going to be actively polling until there are changes for it to see. Um, and as a result, that actually greatly or significantly reduces the battery impact that the Sync API used to have. Um, right. There's like that one connection held open instead of sort of continually tearing down. Don't bring it up. So, so two things. First, just to rather in there, mm -hmm. is long polling now in the core API as well? Uh, no. See, that, that, that <laughs> annoying. <laughs> <laughs> My second question is on permissions. I mean, I know there's a balance between too many permissions and not enough permissions. Mm -hmm. But I have a use case, for instance, where I have an app that I wrote that gets files from a folder that another app wrote. And uh -huh. the only way I can give permissions is to say, oh, you have access to the entire Dropbox. I really want to say, this app of mine 
has permission to this other app's folder. Right, so some sort of basically like delegated well, app folder, kinda, right. you know, that, that app wants it. Um, I know there's a balance between too much and too little. But well, that, that, I mean, that seems like a reasonable request. It's not something. Because I, cause it's like, you know, I get, I'm running an app myself. I'm like, I'm like, I could delete the whole box by accident. Yeah. You know, just, I know you can restore from that, but that just makes you nervous. It'd be nice to say, right. you have access to this folder, but I can't do it because there's no permission for it. Right, yeah. Um, that's a completely reasonable request. I mean, that's, that's the sort of thing we want to we wanna improve. So I think that makes a lot of sense. We don't have it. We don't have anything for you today, but right. Yeah. No, but that, I think that sort of sort of scoped to a folder, but not necessarily your own apps folder. I think is a reasonable thing. There are always difficulties in making any of those things work in every scenario, but uh, but that seems like a reasonable request. We'll we'll definitely consider doing that. If there are no other questions, um, we'll wrap up. So uh, thank you again, everybody. Thanks. <laughs> Bye guys.